All right. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Sharon Boddy, and I'm with the Friends of Carlington Woods and the Friends of Hampton Park. This is our sixth in our eight-part uh, winter web series, and tonight we are very, very happy to host uh, Professor Lenore Farag for an interview about small spaces. So for the best visual experience, you might want to put uh, your set your view onto other speaker or the gallery view to see both of us. And the webinar is being recorded and we will have it up on our YouTube channel at a bit of a later date. So we'll probably have some time for um, uh, questions at the end, but it will be a, an interview um, format. Oh, if I can just get everybody to mute for a second, please. We've got a little bit of background in, uh, coming in there. Thanks very much. All right, so, and we probably will have some, some time at the end for questions. So you can pop some, some of those in the chat. If we don't have get a time, we'll try and get the, the answers afterwards. So um, to get started, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, or our guest rather. Lenore Farig is a professor of biology and a co-director of the Geomatics and Landscape Ecology Research Laboratory at Carleton University. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a Guggenheim Fellow, and is the recipient of so many awards and distinctions, I'm not going to list them all. But in 2022, she was the winner of the 14th Frontiers of Knowledge Award in Ecology. So she and her students researched the efforts of landscape structure on biodiversity and the abundance, distribution, and persistence of wildlife populations. And the study species include frogs, toads, turds, uh, turds, turtles, pardon me, birds, mammals, insects, other arthropods, plants, and lichens. So welcome, Lenore. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, oh, sometimes well. we actually do, we actually do have to count turds, but I won't get into that. Um, <laughs> well, you sort of, uh, have, yeah, you kind of get down into that, don't you? Right. All right. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, oh no, I'm not going to share my screen yet. You're going to ask me a question. Yes, please. I mean, I just wanted to sort of uh, sort of set the stage a little bit because uh, I've been doing a lot of the reading of some of your research papers. So I wanted to set it up a little bit for people. So I know that for a long time, the sort of the common conservation philosophy was you protect the big spaces and you don't really worry so much about the smaller ones because the theory being, okay, wildlife plants, they need a lot of room to move around. Um, so I, you know, from a, an Ottawa perspective, like a Gatineau Park would be more important than say a Vincent Massey Park because it's so much larger under that sort of philosophy. And your research is sort of suggesting, well, there's a little bit more to that and that small spaces are really kind of key and they might actually be able to do things that bigger ones can't. So my first question is, why are they so important in protecting biodiversity? And what are some of the things that they can do Okay, so that's actually a huge question. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to, I'm gonna actually share my screen and I'm gonna back up a few steps um, so that I can kind of get to the, what I hope is the answer to that. So let me just uh, share my screen here. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start bigger than, I am going to start bigger than Ottawa. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about species of, at risk of extinction in Canada. So this, um, this map shows where most of the species at risk in Canada are. So those are the species that are at risk of extinction. And um, as you can see, they're in the south and they're actually in the uh, same places as where we have all of our agriculture and our cities, but it's mostly the agriculture. And the reason for that is because the reason the species are at risk of extinction is the loss of natural habitats. That's the, 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 the top reason for species to be at risk of extinction. And um, the main reason that natural habitats are lost is the expansion of agriculture. And so that's why we have this connection between where we have agriculture and where we have species at risk. So if we zoom in a bit to Southern Ontario, um, you know, several centuries ago, then the, the natural habitat in Southern Ontario was essentially forest. It was almost all forested. And now we're down to maybe 15%, 10 or 15% forest. And you can sort of see where the forest is um, in this, but if you zoom in, it looks like that. So we have little bits of forest distributed in a landscape that's um, that's predominantly agriculture and some and some cities and towns. 
So we've lost all this all this habitat, and and at the same time, and you know, the, and like I said, these are the places where most of the species uh, that we're concerned about going extinct, where they occur, is in these places where we've lost a large amount of the habitat, and the habitat that we have left is in these small patches. So then the question is, are these small patches of natural habitat actually valuable for biodiversity conservation? Um, and this is in the context of several decades of uh, the assumption that we need to be protecting the big the big areas of habitat, which is a problem in Southern Ontario, for example, because there just really aren't very many, if any, big pieces of, of habitat left. So what can be done in that situation? And does that um, sort of assumption actually fit with the data? So this is this is the comparison. It's not it's not a comparison of one big space with one little space. The question is for a given total area of natural habitat, as I've put across the bottom here. So both of these areas, let's say they're landscapes, maybe they're two kilometers by two kilometers, each of these squares. Mm -hmm. And then the green inside here is the is the natural habitat. So you could have one area that, you know, let's say each of these has, I don't know what this works out to, maybe 20%, 15 or 20% habitat. And the one on the left, you've got two big patches and the one on the right, you've got eight small patches. Um, so that's the comparison that we're making. And um, and and so the, the research that, that has been done actually over the last 40 years suggests that for the same total amount of habitat that you have in an area, if that habitat occurs in a lot of small pieces, then you actually end up with higher biodiversity overall. So that's over all of those small patches, you'll have more species. So these little um, shapes, colored shapes that I've put at the bottom here represent different species. So you'll end up with more species where you have a lot of small patches of habitat than where you have a couple of big patches of habitat. Um, so to, you know, to go back to um, the, uh, the Carlington Woods versus the uh, comparison, the comparison of the Carlington Woods versus, I think you said Gatineau Park, you know, Gatineau Park is over 2000, 2400 times as big <laughs> yeah. as Carlington Woods. So just compare, if you were going to make this comparison, you would have to, you would have one giant, um, one giant Gatineau Park, and then you would have uh, 2400 Carly Woods, and you'd be making that comparison. And if you had that, what the suggest, what the su results suggest is that you would have higher biodiversity across 2,400 Carlington Woodses than across um, Gatineau Park. Um, so then you asked why. So uh, I can go unless you want to. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, I can, no, no, no. Okay, I, so I just I keep going. Wanna, okay, I so. kind of want to know why. <laughs> okay, why? Okay. So there's a lot of, I mean, there there's a lot of suggestions and and some support for some of these suggestions. There hasn't been as much research as there needs to be um, to really nail this down, but there are a lot of possible explanations for why there are more um, species, higher biodiversity across many small uh, patches of habitat than a few large ones. Uh, one is that there are more micro habitats. Um, when you're, if you think about just these all these little ones on the bottom here you're sampling a space and you're sampling a space in a sense more completely because you're 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 spreading out these bits of habitat across the whole area whereas at the at the top you've got two big um two big patches and you're you're going to end up sampling fewer of the micro habitats so the the particular um particular kind of conditions that certain different species need so that's one possible explanation. Another one is that in a given area, if we if we control the for the size of the space in the pat in you know I just said maybe two kilometers by two kilometers for these squares, mm -hmm. if you distribute a large number of small patches there, um, then they're going to be on average closer together um, than if you have a couple of, of big ones. So what that means is that um, you know, a lot of species they need to move around. They're not just going to stay put in their in their piece of um, you know um, Hampton Park or whatever. And so and they need to be able to move around between areas of, of natural habitat in the in a landscape. And um, and so it's possible that for a lot of species, a, um, a distribution of small patches will allow more higher movement success. 
Um, there's also this idea of uh, spreading of risk. So, so if you have a disturbance, let's say a fire or an insect outbreak, uh, something like that, uh, disease, um, if you have um, uh, a couple of large areas, then uh, you might have this, that, that disturbance might spread through um, a larger proportion of the total habitat in the area than if that amount of habitat is split up into small areas. So that's another suggestion. Um, also, um, for species that, um, that sort of compete for space, like you can think about uh, bird territories um, or, or even small mammal territories, um, uh, sometimes some species will use the edges of patches to delineate their, their territories. And in that case, if you have a, a larger number of small patches, then you can actually end up with more territories in um, a landscape that has a lot of small patches than in one that has a couple of, of large ones. And then the last one is uh, stabilization of, of predator prey and actually host parasite interactions. So the idea here is that if you have uh, a lot of small areas, actually this is an idea and that goes back to uh, an experiment that was done in the 1950s that showed this to be true in a in kind of an experimental setup. But um, if you have some small, uh, a large number of small patches, then when a predator arrives in a patch, um, it may it might wipe out the prey population there, but meanwhile the prey population can go over to a place where the predator is not is no longer there and can build up its numbers, and then maybe the predator will find it there, and then, but then meanwhile the prey has moved over to another patch. So it's a sort of a dynamic system that allows the um, both the predator and the prey to persist over time. Okay. So I think that's my answer to question. Well, and it, it kind of it. it, it goes nicely into the next one because you know we, we when you talk about small how small is small oh yeah okay <laughs> um okay. So. some of the research that you know you said you know to, you know that such and such a spice hampton is 10 hectares carlington yeah. is 22 i mean so yeah um yeah is it more okay. the quality so, of the habitat <laughs> yeah and the yeah okay so um so I'll just show you this this figure right here for that. Okay. So this is from um, this is from a uh, a paper that um, is is probably about to be published with a with a, a colleague and what uh, named Federico Riva and what he uh, did was he 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 did a whole bunch of comparisons of numbers of species in. Uh, several small patches versus a few large patches of the same total area. So just the kind of comparison that I was just talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, he took all these from research studies that have been done and published in the literature, and then he just compiled them all together and did these comparisons. So what we have here along the uh, y-axis, number of patches. So this mm -hmm. is the distribution of patch sizes. And this is actually on a log scale for those of you that are used to thinking about that. So one is here, 10 is there, 100 is there, 1000 is there. So in terms of patch sizes. So, and, and then what, what we did is we looked up, you know, what are the typical minimum patch size criteria? So that means what do uh, legislators or policies usually have as a minimum size of patch below which they're not going to give protection? So automatic protection. And some of those criteria are typically sort of 100 hectares, even 1,000 hectares, even 5,000 hectares. So these are just around the world, different places around the world, what is kind of considered to be the smallest patch size that we're going to you know, give protection to. And if, but if you look at this, um, this distribution of patch, uh, patch sizes, the typical patch size in these studies is, is actually less than 10 hectares. Yeah. And what that means is that the combination of these small patches that are less than 10 hectares, the value of those for biodiversity is high, is as high or higher than um, the value of these single large patches that are over 100 or 1000 hectares. So how small is too small? For sure, for sure, um, you know, Carlington Woods and Hampton Park are not too small, and um, and even smaller places are not too small. Is what it turns out. What it turns out to be. Um, the question about quality is obviously a valid a valid one, and um, you know, you can imagine. I'm sure you've had a lot of presentations about 
quality of habitat already. So all of that applies no matter what size the, the, natural, the natural area is. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. That I'm I'm <laughs> I'm I'm happy to hear that because <laughs> I was also in a forum this morning that they're doing some um, uh, testing in the Petawawa Research Forest, and that's they're taking ten hectares of that, and they're sort of uh, they're growing species, native species of trees in more southern areas, and then bringing them into this test forest, and it's only ten hectares, so it's like aha, there's another one I would, wouldn't mind getting some information on. Well, right. you brought up, you know, sort of the criteria, the legislative, um, you know, sort of aspect and kind of goes into the next question. And that's about what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong in terms of, you know, city and other government levels. Um, you know, we've made some progress, certainly on some of the forestry issues, and we've signed a climate declaration. But, you know, a lot of people just don't know if, if we're really doing the right things or not. Um, what's from your perspective, what are, what are you looking at? What are you seeing from in our, in our town? In terms of what we're doing, in terms of Ottawa, what we're doing, what, what we're doing right and wrong in Ottawa? Yeah. Uh, okay, so, um, so the big problem, I guess, in terms of what, what, what we're doing wrong is the same thing that we're doing wrong everywhere is, um, is that we have this, you know, death by a thousand cuts problem happening. Um, where it's really hard to protect a small space from development or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is that that adds up. And, you know, like I said, if, if you, you know, if, if you have one little, it's, you know, comparing one little space to one big space is in a sense, a not a fair comparison. But if you have a lot of little spaces that add up to that big space, then you end up with, you have higher biodiversity in that, in that, those many small spaces and so they should be offered protection um like there's no real real rationale in a sense for not protecting the small the small spaces um so you know like little pocket of trees here a little small wetland there um you know they all add up so so what we need to be doing is i guess having a plan um uh you know Basically, how much do we want to have that's natural in the region, and um, and how can we get there? Um, and 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 really, you know, that's what has to happen. Probably, it, it needs there needs to be some restoration of natural areas, not just protection of of what we um, have. Yeah. Um, in terms of what are we doing right? Um, so one thing is community groups. Like community groups are are really, I think, the power behind. Um, trying to to protect nature in the places where, you know, like I said, southern and, and eastern Ontario, where we have uh, so many species at risk. Mm -hmm. um, so just all that pressure by community groups. I was thinking about. I you probably heard about um, there was going to be. I think it was a BMW car dealership oh. has. A, yeah, you, yeah. So you know, it was basically the community around there that said you cannot cut down this. A little bit of forest, mm -hmm. you know, to make a parking lot, to enlarge the parking lot, and they just put a got a lot of attention paid to it. So it was the, that was a hunt club forest, I believe. If somebody yes, yeah, yeah it was hunt club, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So you know, and then also, uh, you know, the city is gradually improving the rules about when you can cut trees down and when you can't. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all pressure from com community groups as well. So, yeah. you know, it, it's just, it, it just has to be constant pressure. I think. Right. Are, are you seeing any success stories, like not necessarily even within Ottawa or something, you know, that we should be emulating, um, you know? Um, I think, well, one, one success story, um, I think that's still ongoing is Paris. Um, they have had a mayor in Paris for, I guess, I guess she's now in her second term and her, her plan is, is to basically make Paris really, um, green and resilient, resilient to climate change, but also, um, just high biodiversity. And they've, they've got, uh, a, a ton of just little spaces. I mean, that's what they're doing is they're, they're just any little space that they can, they're trying to sort of. Um, make it more higher quality kind of green it they're they're putting the, those insect hotels everywhere you know and they're and, and all kinds of you know 
wildflowers and native plants and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, just every place that they can kind of get their hands on. And uh, also cutting down on traffic. They're in, uh, putting in place, uh, you know, sort of rules and closing roads and things like that. So, I mean, I think there's there's probably, that's just one example. I think there are probably even better examples um, uh, of, of, you know, doing things, doing things right. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, COVID was a COVID was an opportunity, you know, to see what could be done. So I think people have seen that that yeah, we can probably uh, live with you know live with, with with less traffic, and we probably could have more walking and uh, space and more green space and you know all together. Yeah, yeah, that would be lovely. Eh? I I know that you know from the some of the the previous ecological assessments we've had, you know, of Carlington of Hampton. It seems as if people were always surprised at the high level of biodiversity, considering where these spaces are and that they're in the middle of a city. So it seems to be bearing out the fact that, yeah, they are smaller, but they're still hanging on to quite a number of species here. Mm -hmm. um, now, on that note, I know you don't separate out, you know, separate the data out, but I know that we first sort of connected when we found the, the sampling tubes that some of your students had had uh, put into, into Carlington. Is there anything in particular you remember about any of the data from Carlington? Like, was there anything in, that you could remember or recall for us? So, yeah, so I didn't do this sampling. It was yeah. my students. Yeah. Um, so I had, um, so actually, uh, so I guess Carlington was one site of 70 sites that they surveyed. Um, and uh, the the design of the study was actually to look at this question of, you know, how much forest is there in the surrounding? So you have a site and then you ask, you know, how much forest is there in the surrounding landscape? And then is it in one big piece or a few big pieces or is it in lots of small pieces? And then uh, a third thing they were looking at is to what extent is it connected by hedgerows between those forest patches? And um, so they so they selected sites to so that they could have gradients in those three things: the amount of forest, the number of patches, and the um, amount of uh, hedgerows. And uh, so that they could look at those three things separately. So this so so somehow I'm not exactly sure why Carlington was in there, but but it fit one of those you know a, a requirement for finding sites to to um, to create those gradients. Um, but I did ask the students. So then, so then they selected the sites, and then uh, one student was was surveying the small mammals. That that's what the tubes are are for. Yeah. So those tubes have um, inside. There's a piece of of paper, and stapled to the stapled to the middle of the paper is a piece of a wax paper that has some carbon black on it. And so then, when a small mammal runs through the tube, it leaves its footprints, and you can tell what species it is. So. So, so she would have, I think she was had maybe 30 tubes in each site. Um, and uh, that, that was a huge amount of work. Um, <laughs> and, and then I had another student who was doing birds. So she had these things called audio moth recorders that she had on, a, on the tree. And then um, another student who was doing plants. And so he was doing um, plant surveys in quadrats. Cool. So, That's so cool. I have never, not been there, but I did ask them what they found yeah. <laughs> and, you know, what they found because, because I was going to be talking to you. So, um, so the, the guy, uh, the guy doing the plants, Joe, he said mm -hmm. that, that you do have a nice, uh, uh, high density of butternut trees. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's nice. He also said that he saw, this wasn't part of his plant surveys, but he saw a bear's head tooth fungus. He saw that you had a family of foxes. Yep. And he also saw uh, that you have a large uh, density of trout li lilies. Um, and then for the birds, um, there were nine species of birds apparently. And including a great crested flycatcher, which is which is one that's declining in Ontario. So, you know, it's a, of interest, special interest. Um, but actually, birds, you know, especially um, insect feeding birds are in decline in general in North America. So, uh, so yeah, this is uh, um, yeah. anyway. This is uh, the, the the small mammals. Apparently, it was just the regular small mammals. <laughs> Yeah. We, we've seen some interesting, you know, we, we've seen, I think somebody saw, saw a grouse in there once. I've definitely yeah. seen foxes for sure. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. the, the weird thing about Carlington is for a lot of people still think of it as scrubland. Yeah. And yet we do have canker free butternuts, which yeah. a lot of places cannot say anymore. We do have disease free ones. Yeah. So it's it's a great place. Yeah. But, and we would be happy to walk you through it at any point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so in one of the interviews that I saw with you, I love this, uh, the way you put it, that the, you saw you said that each species is more valuable, valuable to you than the most priceless work of art. And I think a lot of us feel the same way. I also know that a lot of people will not see this through anything other than economics. So I know that some municipal governments are starting to add in th th those actual dollar figures to make the point that we need to protect these these places. They're actually going to save us money potentially in the long run, um, particularly for climate change uh, impacts. So I know this is kind of a nasty question, but does that utility, you know, having the sort of financial argument there, is it is there a role for that in your research or is that more you know, maybe the finance guy should be handling that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, I haven't gotten into that much myself. Mm. Uh, so it's 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 ecosystem services, um, and it's it's if it's valuation of ecosystem services. So calculating calculating what service the ecosystem supplies to people, and then trying to estimate how much that is worth. Mm. Um, you know, one. Uh, an example is is you know more the more shade trees we have in the city, uh, I mean that has a huge effect on the temperature to have to have large trees and uh, so you could I guess calculate how much you could save in terms of uh, power use for air conditioning you know you could do something like that. Um, there's the classic one that people that people um, talk about is New York City um, that um, New York City. Uh, was this is probably a good twenty years ago, but they they uh, were concerned about their water supply, mm -hmm. and um, and about development in the watershed that supplies their water supply, which is basically the cats. Is it called the Catskills? Yeah, and um, and they calculated that protecting the watershed itself by you know either buying up areas or having regulation you know having regulations paying people not to not to put in parking lots or whatever they were doing um that that was going to be one sixth the cost of uh building a treatment plant big enough for new york city mm -hmm. so that is what they did they they brought in all kinds of um means to protect the cats the cats hill cat skills area so the the watershed so that's that's kind of the this the one that you'll see in the textbooks you know in terms of uh, ecosystem services valuation um you know like you said before i i prefer to think of species as being priceless <laughs> so um you know there the thing is too that there are an awful lot of species can be lost without really a detectable effect um you know on human uh on at, at least money monetary effect yeah. there are definitely effects on human well-being um for biodiversity we actually had a study um this is the only study that i've that i've that i've done on this but um uh, i had a student a few years ago who started up the uh, ottawa breeding bird count so we have we have these sites or he has these sites across ottawa with bird data and so um, I had in my back of my head for quite a while that when the right student came along, one thing we could do, and we ended up doing this, would be to um, survey the people and find out whether there's any connection between bird diversity, because we know the bird diversity and uh, and their sense of well-being or how much they like their neighborhood or whatever. So um, so I did have a student who did that, and she she designed the study really well because the student the um, she she surveyed more than a thousand people across the city, and um, they didn't know that they she she sort of led them into the questions without and they weren't allowed to go back, so they didn't know that she was really asking them about nature. You know, she asked them, "How do you feel about you know your neighborhood within the you know within the uh, the few blocks around you? You know, compared to other neighborhoods." and and you know questions about how they you know that kind of thing and then afterwards analyzed the results and found a relationship a pretty strong relationship between the diversity of birds 
and uh, people's appreciation of their of their neighborhood. So, so and after controlling for things like their income level and all you know various things like that. So, um, so there is there is a an ecosystem like ecosystem services includes things like uh, things like aesthetics and sense of sense of well being and that that kind of thing um, happiness. Uh, so, which are not necessarily monetary, monetary um, things. Um, so there are there are connections between biodiversity and those those things, but but like I said, you there are places in the world where um, you know uh, quite a lot of species have been lost, and there's no necessary connection, I guess, between between uh, between that and the monetary. Yeah. I don't know the financial. <laughs> whatever situation right, you're okay. yeah you know so so i think it's i think it's a little bit almost a little bit dangerous because you can just turn around and and build the treatment plant you know so yeah, yeah. Well, i just i know i'm I, i've i've sort of dined out on on the information because the ncc did an economic analysis of all of its capital lands and they gave a figure you know wetlands are worth this much per hectare forests are worth this much I keep using that, throwing it out because some people, some people will connect with the financial uh, uh, argument. I don't necessarily, but I know that some people will. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I think the last real question I have is, what's next? What are you? What are the pieces of the puzzle that you're still looking at? What are some of the things you are going to be researching and getting your students to research? Uh, well, I could I could share my screen again yeah. for that. Um, let me see here. I don't know. This is kind of a last minute thing. So I hope that it's going to be clear what I'm talking about. So this is where we were before. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wait a minute here. Why isn't it moving there? Oh, I was going to try. Oh, this is I can go through these quickly. This is this is stuff I forgot to tell, tell you about. We have, we have done we have done work in the city. Mm -hmm. um, on uh, looking at biodiversity and and green spaces. And um, so just to say that you do have more species when you have more green space, but even when we're looking at very small spaces, so in your question about how small is small, mm -hmm. what we have found, so here I'm comparing on the left, you know, two large-ish parks to the same total area of green space in the backyards of all those of all those houses. And basically what our research shows is that you get the same benefit for biodiversity. So, you know, how small is small? It can be very small. Um, okay, so so going to what I'm working on now. Okay, so, so this has to do with one of the arguments. So, you know, I'm telling you what our results are, but they're not without controversy, you know. Yes, I, I've been we, have, <laughs> we have had the forty years of 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 this assumption about about large spaces being needed, and or being uh, more valuable than you know a large number of small spaces. So, and this is one of the arguments that's being used, which is uh, referred to as negative edge effects. And so, this is something that I've been working on to to try to um, kind of. Um, reconcile this idea with the results that we have. So, so if we if we start here, so this green square is a patch of let's say forest, mm -hmm. and so we have an edge species, which is a species that you're more likely to find on the edge, or near the edge, than in the interior. And then you have an interior species, which is a species that you're more likely to find in the interior of the forest than at the edge of the forest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, so these uh, interior and edge species are identified uh, by uh, often by these transects. So what I've got here is a patch of uh, forest, and in and this represents on the left a sample site in the center of the of the of the patch, and then in the middle it's the sample site, which is the red X, is closer to the edge, and on the right the sample site is right on the X. So the sample site being where the audio moth recorder is or where the where the plant uh, quadrat is or where the small mammal tubes are. Okay. So so the these edge effects, edge species and interior species. So a positive edge effect is would have the density or occurrence of the species would be increasing as you go from the interior to the edge. So that's why this line goes up. 
So that's a positive edge effect for an edge species. And then the interior species, um, the uh, density or occurrence is going down as you get closer to the edge. Okay, so that's the interior species. So the reason that people um, are focusing on this is because if you consider, they're making this thing, which is called a cross-scale extrapolation, but that doesn't really matter. But what if you consider a landscape, so now if we go back to that two kilometer by two kilometer landscape, so now we have uh, low fragmentation. So we have the same amount of habitat again in these three landscapes. And in the one on the left, we have a couple of big patches. In the one in the middle, we have a larger number of sort of medium-sized patches. And then the one on the right, we have lots and lots of little patches. But each of these has the same total habitat. And we are sampling, now our sample site is in the middle of each of these landscapes. So if we have a species that, that uh, is more likely to be found at the edge than the interior, if you look on the right-hand side, this square with all the little patches has a lot of edge. All those, all those little patches, you add, add up to having a lot of edge, forest edge. Uh, whereas on the left-hand side, these two big patches have a lot of forest interior. So the assumption is that uh, if you have a species that is an interior species, it should be more found where you have only a couple of big patches. And if you have a species that's an edge species, it should be more likely to be found in a landscape where you have a lot of little patches. Okay. So that is this extrapolation. So we have the positive fragmentation effect. So that's an increase with fragmentation going along with the positive edge effect and the negative fragmentation effect going along with the negative edge effect. Whoops, sorry. So that's the prediction that people make, but they it seems so obvious that that it hasn't actually really been tested. Well, it hasn't been tested. Um, it's just been assumed. So that's what I'm working on now. So, so why do you, I just, just, I mean, I can give you a couple more slides. I don't know how much time we have, but oh, we've got plenty. It's only okay, eight, okay. It's five after eight. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so, so the point is, even though that sounds really obvious, like if you have more edge, then you're going to have more edge species. And if you have more interior, then you're going to have more interior species. Um, the problem is that you've uh, you've you've jumped from this transect within a patch to a statement about the whole landscape, what is going to happen over the whole landscape. And I already showed you all those reasons why, you know, those predator prey interactions, the competition, the disturbance uh, spreading, the movement, all of those reasons why you might actually have more species or an individual species might be more likely to occur in a more fragmented landscape. So, so, so what can actually happen because of all that is even though you have, so now we have our interior species that's more likely to be found at the interior of a patch than the edge of the patch. And so here in both of these landscapes, it's still more likely to be found in the interior of the patch than the edge, but the total size of the population is higher in the more fragmented landscape, even though it has more edge, uh, possibly because of one of those explanations. And you could have the opposite happen as well, where you have an edge species that is um, you know, more abundant, even though it's in the edge in both of these landscapes, it's more abundant in the place where there's actually less edge. So it's just to say that you can't automatically make this extrapolation. So I've been doing, I have one student who's working on this. I've done a bit of a, of a preliminary test myself. So this is what the data look like. And I'll just explain to you. So, uh, so this is the slope of the edge effect. So that's the line. Does it go up or go down in that plot that I just showed you? Yeah. And this is the direction of the fragmentation effect. So that's, does the fragmentation line go up or down what I just showed you. Mm -hmm. So like I said, we expect the, uh, you know, the, what, what we expect, what people have been expecting is that if you have a positive edge effect, you'll have a positive fragmentation effect and vice versa. So that would mean where the edge effect is positive, the fragmentation effect is positive, and where the edge effect is negative, the fragmentation effect is negative. Um, and so all the points, if that was true, all the points on this plot should be inside these two circles, hmm. but they're not. 
<laughs> so what that suggests is that this extrapolation from the edge effect to the fragmentation effect is not working out. So that's kind of like a preliminary result. That there's there's a lot more to be done on that. So that's that's probably one of the main things that, uh, that I'm working on that some of my students are working on. Oh. And uh, yeah, that's I think a big project. Holy leaf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to see. I'm going to open it up to anybody else who has any questions because I, you know, had some official uh, questions for you, and then we can just have a a general discussion. So if anybody does have we can throw this open, but I mean, this is great. I love this sort of stuff. <laughs> and you've been working on this for how many years? Like this is, this is your life's work basically, right? Yeah. I mean, we've, uh, I've done other things as well. Um, there's been a lot of work in my lab on effects of roads on wildlife, yes. Yeah. Uh, on, on wildlife population. So we've done a ton of, of work on that, that mm. for a long time was something that uh, graduate students were really interested in, in working on. Yeah, because um, so that's, that. that's tricky in a city, right? Like, I mean, for, for urban, like preserving urban, you know, it, it, just yeah. even thinking of ours places, they've got the Queensway and Carling Avenue. If Because I know foxes go through Hampton Park. They don't den here, but they go through it. So we're obviously part of the corridor. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm very, you know, cognizant now of sort of taking a bird's eye view and looking above us and seeing where should we be connecting or where should we be regenerating some areas, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe speak a little bit about roadkill then and that impact on, on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, roadkill has big impact, uh, impact on wildlife populations. So there's there's no question about, about that. Um, we do know, so we've done a big um, uh, literature review meta-analysis on all of the work that's been done on that. And, um, the species and populations that are most impacted by roads are amphibians and reptiles. So, so when when you know that's important to know because what it means is that if we want to to mitigate or reduce the effects of roads, we have to be thinking about the species that are most impacted. Um, even though we may see dead deer um, on on the roads, or we may you know be worried about that for our own safety. Um, it, it's not really having a, much of an effect on their populations, the roadkill, whereas it is having an effect on, on the amphibians and, and reptiles. So, so then the question is, how do you, how do you mitigate that, um, yeah. that effect? And uh, there's been a fair bit of work on that, um, on that, but uh, it's, it's not easy for sure, but. Uh, no, and especially, you know, within, within an urban setting too, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very yeah. difficult and it's not just car traffic either. I mean, we've seen run over snakes, you know, um, by bicycles. Yeah. Um, Lord knows I've almost stepped on, I don't know how many snakes, you know, in my day, cause they just, Oh, wait a minute. There you are. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why, uh, reptiles can be, uh, vulnerable is because because a road is a lot like a rock you know and if they want if you need to warm up then it's a great place to go warm up so um as if you're a if you're a snake or a lizard or whatever so uh so yeah it makes them quite yeah. vulnerable to, to roadkill okay well i see i've got a hand up lara if you wanted to unmute yourself hey there hi <laughs> so, did you have a question I do. I have a million questions. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll <limit> myself. <laughs> but thank you so much. This is really nice to uh, spend your evening with us. That's uh, very kind of you to, to share your, all your research and knowledge. So um, I'm part of, um, I guess, uh, groups of citizens that aim to protect the green space in cities. So um, maybe just to start with, I'll, have, I'll throw out two questions and give other people a chance and then maybe pop back on. But i um, curious from a citizen perspective, as we attempt to kind of map some of the biodiversity in some of the green spaces around our houses and some of these small spaces, do you have any guidance? Because more and more we're, we're hiring people to undertake inventories um, and what I've read of them, they're quite different. And so if we actually want to try to get a sense of comparison, which we can then, you know, used to lobby i mean i think all green spaces are valuable i mean there's so few left honestly in our cities but right. for from uh, like i i 
you know work with this you know, work with the cities but i advocate for the protection of green spaces and how do we translate that into what should be prioritized or not i guess mm -hmm. um but is there a way that you would suggest inventorying something so that we have something a better comparison across all these green spaces is there like a um well so what so if you want to be able to compare across green spaces then uh what you need to do is is control for or or um plan it so that the amount of effort you spend per area is the same so so let's say you're doing um let's say you're doing uh plant quadrats um, that that uh, you know you would say I'm going to do one quadrat for every you know half hectare or something like that. So so you so that you have a consistent sampling method. Um, so that would be the most important thing to in order to be able to actually compare across across locations. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's important is to um, do the samples. You know, do do the samples in a way that you're actually going to get the full picture. So, um, you know, if you're if you're doing, let's say, um, insects that you 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 need to do the samples several times over the course of the summer, um, because different insects will be, you know, flying at different times of the summer. Um, I don't know. You so probably know as much as emeralds too, right? Even exactly, the yeah. Plants you have to do more than once. Um, so, you know, the thing is, it, it does take some effort and uh, to make things really comparable, it takes planning. There's, you know, these days there's, uh, there are these things, e-butterfly, e-bird, all these, you know, you can, you can, uh, it's citizen science um, databases, you can, you can record what you've seen in a location and those are building up to being really, really useful, but they're hard to analyze because of this effort problem that there will be certain places where lots of people will go. And so then you end up with lots of records there. Then nobody thinks about looking at, you know, the back or a backyard in a particular location or, you know, this was actually came up with in with COVID in that, um, you know, suddenly people were seeing all these all this wildlife and then the question was well was it always there and we weren't looking where or you know is it actually are we do we actually have more wildlife so so those are the kinds of of issues that come up when you want to make those kinds of comparisons mm -hmm. okay, i've got a thank you I've got a comment and then somebody else has a question as well. Um, Stephen mentions it's interesting. It matches up with his observations in Toronto. Uh, I see a huge variety of sizes and types of habitats across the city, and there's probably fewer species overall in the two or three very large areas than all of the small ones added up. But the total is dependent on the quality of the habitats. Backyards with a pool and a hard surface are much worse <laughs> than those that are full of wild vegetation, obviously. Right. Yes. But I, right. I did like I, I liked what you had mentioned about, you know, like even even with yards could be comparable to a small space mm -hmm. because depending on what's in there, and we're certainly encouraging people to, you know, grow native in their, in their own. Well, yard. and the other thing you can do in, in your yard is when you do have uh, vegetation dying uh to not always remove it so um so we had uh an elm tree that that was in our yard it, it didn't get that big before you know it got i don't know how big maybe it's hmm, i don't know I don't, I don't know anyways it got fairly large but not huge before it, it died um and uh and instead of having having it all having it cut down we just had the top uh branches taken off because the issue with a with a tree uh, like that, a dead tree in the city is people don't want it to fall over. And, you know, we're, we're in that in very close quarters, quarters here. So that we did that probably 15 years ago. And, and that tree, um, it's had woodpeckers living in it for, for quite a while. And, um, and, you know, so clearly there's all of, and there's all kinds of insects and everything living in there, lots of wood boring insects and everything. So having, you know, part of the habitat quality is actually also having dead stuff in your in your uh in your little green spaces oh for yeah. sure yeah oh most definitely we try and get people to stop taking it away or building forts out of it beatrice yeah. i see your hand is up so if you wanted to unmute yourself yeah thank you um i just want to say first of all really super duper interesting um i just wanted to comment that your research on how um 
smaller patch size doesn't necessarily lead to more edge species is really interesting. Like I've studied environmental sciences at school and like that's what you hear so much is like, oh, smaller spaces, more edge species, less interior species, therefore it's bad. Um, but I guess to lead into that, um, another thing you hear a lot is that like with smaller spaces that can lead to isolation and then that there's less like genetic mixing among different like populations among these patches. Like, have you looked into that? Have you, is like, is that also a myth or? So the thing is that uh, when we, when we uh, think about these things, it's really hard to keep in mind the, the issue of the total amount of habitat. So if you go back to, I don't know if you were here at the beginning when I showed the, um, the Google um, Earth thing of Southern Ontario and then the, and then the, the sort of close-up version of it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Southern Ontario, you have 10 or 15% forest. And so, you know, you're not going to have wolves. Uh, when you only have 10 or 15% forest, but that's what it's about. It's about the amount of forest that's there. It's not about the, the sizes of those patches. If you had 40% forest, even if it was still in all those little bits, you would have wolves. Like, you know, there's there's no um, connection between the, it being a big patch. And, or, and so anyway, so the reason I mention that is because isolation confounds those two things. If you have an isolated patch, that means you have very little habitat in the landscape surrounding that patch. So, uh, so yeah, if you have like a, 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 a very isolated patch, then, um, then you have very little habitat and you will have few species and you'll have low small populations and you'll have low genetic diversity all, and all those things. But it's not really about the size of the patch. It's about the fact that there's so little habitat in that landscape. Right. Thank you. It's hard, it's hard to separate those things in your brain, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lara, did you have another question? Your hand was still up. <laughs> <laughs> Good, go for it. Um, I'm wondering about the issue of connectivity between those patches. Mm -hmm. And again, I bring it down to <laughs> one thing we're trying to do is um, to save a quote unquote corridor off the, the Gatineau Park. And it's incredibly hard, again, to translate, um, I guess, whatever's out there in the scientific world to something to a policymaker or to a developer and say, this is how much needs to be saved between these habitat patches. Because I understand it's very complex based on different species and they have different needs, but then how, how at the end of the day, we still need to give some sort of like guidance to people if we're advocating for it. And so what yeah. has your research? Um, so admitting that is an incredibly complex question, but then like, how do we communicate that to advocate for connectivity. So what's the, what in an urban area, cause obviously it's gonna be yeah. different if it's not an urban area, but in an urban area specifically where there are such huge pressures, have you have you come across any guidance um, in terms of how large, um, I guess the corridors should be? Well, um, so one issue is that, uh, that the research that's been done or a fair bit of the research that's been done um, and this would be done on, on larger mammals like, you know, coyotes or, or, uh, foxes and things like that, um, that, that they don't follow those corridors. Mm -hmm. So, so they're, you know, they're moving around a lot of times they're moving around at night and you'd be surprised. I mean, the, the winter is fun because you can see if you live in, in town, you know, you can see their trails and they're just like, they are not, you know, following whatever corridor we like to, you know, make for them. So, so I think I would go back to that um, point where I was saying about movement success, that actually the best way to, to, to maintain connectivity is to have the natural space distributed widely throughout the area that you're concerned about. And, um, and not worry so much about it being shaped like a corridor, but to make sure that there's enough of it so that it's kind of easy for things to hop from one bit to the other, because they're not going to stick to your corridor anyway. Um, and so then if they encounter, you know, a large swath of concrete and cars, then, you know, that's going to be more dangerous than if that the whole region had uh, lots of lots of bits of green space throughout. Um, that's, 
in one ways it's that's harder because you're not, it's hard to you know you're not saying okay well if we just make this corridor right here then it'll be fine uh, but on the other on the other sense it's maybe easier because you're not limiting the priority areas to a particular portion of the landscape right then and one of the things is that um that the opportunities for concert for conservation come up when they when they come up they might not come up in your so-called corridor you know or the place where you've decided it's going to be a corridor but we should grab those anyway because they're still valuable you know just what i've been saying about these small patches being valuable so if if you don't constrain your design to a particular space that's you know shaped like a like a corridor uh, then you can maybe take advantage of more opportunities i was i i was um a little bit perturbed to talk to be talking to someone from um, uh, a uh, conservation organization um, that and who who actually said that that you know they will have people um, you know offering to you know kind of donate their land for protection and they won't take it if it's too small and uh, and, I, and I was just like, I didn't say anything, but I just was like, oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> and so it'd be like that, you know, not taking it because it's, it's not in the right place for a, a for a notional corridor. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where I, where I'm standing now on the whole uh, connectivity corridor thing. It's, Same it's harder. We can. <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of what it comes down to, you know, um, obviously, if you have waterways, that's a particular situation where it's really important to have green space, um, you know, along waterways, um, just because so many species will, will be, you know, needing to, to use that particular kind of habitat that's adjacent to waterways. And then those can, that, you know, can, I guess, create uh, at least the illusion of corridors for us, so. <laughs> Well, I, I suppose we can, you know, we can all individually help certainly for uh, pollinating insects, right? So we can encourage those within our own yards and then oh, yeah. the birds eat them and yada, yada, yada. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. No, yeah. I think that's, that's one thing that I think has been going well is that is the attention that's been paid to pollinators and people really wanting to do something about it. And, and it's great, you know, doing it on, on a postage stamp lawn is fine. You know, it's, it, it all adds up. So oh, yeah. Yeah. We've actually been told, we've been asked actually by our, by the NCC, because we work with them not to plant any more milkweed <laughs> with just the common <laughs> stuff. We can do the butterfly and then the, you know, the, the swamp milkweed and the horrible milkweed, but no more common milkweed, please. It's like, no problem. <laughs> Why? Why did they ask you not to do that? Because there, it's actually, there's too much of it. I mean, you know, in our spaces, there isn't, um, but, you know, it self seeds pretty well. Uh, we tie yeah. up the, some of the little seed pods at the, you know, when in late August, September, just a little bit of string so that the, the seeds stay, but it has become a big problem for, for the NCC. They're having to actually take it out in some spots because it's taking over. Oh. It's becoming <laughs> a bit of a monoculture. Oh. <laughs> so, so that that message really got through to us, the monarchs. That that it just shows you right. that that does get through. Yeah, um, it was a very successful. Um, yeah, for that. Yeah, and it, it's not. It, it's it's interesting because I mean, it it, it I'm sure it, it helps, but the monarchs are still are still in trouble. Oh, yes. the territory monarchs are still in trouble, and I actually have a student who's just about at the point in his thesis where he can do this estimation but he his his as um thesis is about monarchs and it is he is he is trying to estimate uh road mortality on on the monarch mar uh, migration because you know over the 20 years over the past 20 years the monarch population has crashed and over those 20 years, the traffic volumes across North America have, have you know, gone up exponentially. And so, so really, like, what is the likelihood of a monarch butterfly that's born in Ontario actually making it to Mexico, which is where it has to spend the winter, um, without getting killed by a truck? Yeah. Uh, it has a lot of roads to cross uh, between between here and there. So, yeah. so um, anyway, just that's a bit of a side issue, but yeah. yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm sure there's also a need for for more milkweed. Where maybe oh, not, I, I maybe think maybe not, not in, the, in, the green belt, but in, in, in our particular, you know, in our particular wood sort of thing. Within you know yeah. some things that we're doing, they said no, we don't need any more of that. Bring in some right. of the other species of milkweeds. That's okay. fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we are coming up right on 830 and I don't see any more questions in the chat. So I'm going to end it here. But thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with us. And this will be it's being recorded. So it will be up on the website probably by this weekend. OK. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you, everybody. And have yourselves a lovely evening. OK. Bye. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>